Hello, everybody. My name's Seven Song, as you well know by now. Uh, right now, I'm in northern Arizona. Maybe John can pan to the environment in the, where we're sitting right now. Mostly ponderosa pine, uh, gamble oak, this yellow, beautiful flower everywhere, which I'm not sure which Asteraceae it is, or even the genus. And then we're also sitting with the plant we're going to talk about for a little while, which is yarrow, uh, right over here. So we're at the Traditions of Western Herbalism Conference, and soon to be changed to Medicine for the People Conference. Um, and we're just we're somewhere south of Flagstaff, and it's just beautiful here. Well, today's a beautiful day, a little bit cool. It's mid-September. So John has been following me around a little bit. We were at the Rainbow Gathering in Washington State. Uh, we've been to my house where I've talked a, a lot about different herbs. And now we're in northern Arizona, uh, mostly to just focus on the yarrow plant. So this is yarrow, Achillea millifolium. Achillea, named after Achilles, uh, a famous, I forget my uh, mythology or part, I guess, history. Uh, but he was a general or a high-ranking soldier. And the reason this is, might have been named after Achilles is that it was used, he used it with his soldiers as a wound-staunching agent, as a hemostat. But I'll come back to that later. Um, so Achillea, that's what it is, millifolium means thousand-leafed. And so folium as in foliage. And the reason it's called thousand leafed, and John will probably get close ups later, is that each leaf is divided into many small segments. So the leaf is not compound, but the small sections of it are finely divided to the midrib, giving a kind of ferny appearance. The family of plants that Yarrow is a member of is the same as many plants, this big yellow one right here, this beautiful one, which is the Asteraceae. And the Asteraceae is about the largest family of plants on the earth. About one out of every 10 or so plants is in the family Asteraceae. Uh, when I say something about plant families, the Asteraceae, when families are named, it's, it's not about their medicinal uses. So Asteraceaes run a gamut of edible, uh, things like Jerusalem artichoke, and medicinal uses. So I just want to say that uh, botany is based on floristic or reproductive characteristics, not medicinal characteristics. So the reason we're talking about yarrow, first it's in the logo of this uh, video series. That's the leaf that kind of comes up over herb first aid. And the reason that that's picked is because it really is one of my favorite first aid plants. As you might have gathered from watching me for this amount of time, is that, or maybe this is an early video in this, is that I'm somewhat skeptical about uses of plants. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't say that with a question mark. I'm often not sure of how the information that I've heard from other people, how true it is. And so I like to use plants regularly and to see the results. One of the beauties of first aid is that it's one of the places uh, where often you can see fairly dramatic results. Pain bad, pain better. Bleeding bad, bleeding better. We'll come back to hemostats. Um, those things uh, really specifically. With chronic illness, it's just hard to see the changes and know how well the herbs are working. So as somebody who just wants proof in front of my eyes sometimes of clinical herbalism, uh, first aid is a good place. And yarrow is one of the classic plants for that for me. So Achillea millifolium. There's some debate over different species. Some folks say that the native species of the United States is Achillea lanulosa. Uh, they look a little different, but for medicinal sake, those two species are interchangeable. And most people call that Achillea millifolium. There's also the beautiful ones that people grow in their gardens, the yellows and the pastels. I'm not talking about them as medicine. I haven't uh, used them and I'm not really tempted to. So one of the first things uh, one of the first reasons that yarrow is so useful as a medicine is that it's a circumboreal plant. It grows often in the northern hemisphere of planet Earth. In other words, it grows here, it grows in parts of Europe, it grows in parts of China, it grows in parts of Asia. So it doesn't grow everywhere in there, but the plant has a very wide distribution. 
in the United States and Canada, it has a wide distribution as well. And so it's a plant that one can often find. Maybe not in abundance, but the first thing, it's not threatened. So, so the ethics of wild crafting say that really you can gather plenty of yarrow. I mean, you don't want to dig up everything from everywhere. We'll talk about wild crafting and gathering in a minute. But it's a plant that you can find, and so you don't have to carry it with you if you know there's going to be yarrow where you're going, and yarrow is common. So yarrow is not going to be, for instance, in a desert. It needs some shade, some water. It just can't, it just can't be that hot and dry for it. Um, so one of the reasons I like yarrow, it's plentifulness and it's uh, the ethics, just the availability of gathering it and making my own medicine from it. The parts used from yarrow, if I have John swing the camera over here, um, is going to be the above ground parts in general. There's some uses for the lower parts, but I haven't used them. So basically, you bust out your trusty pruners that are nice and sharp, and I'm just going to cut it from the base of the plant And then if I'm going to make medicine from this, I, I'll discuss soon what kind of medicine, how to use it. Right now, just some simple gathering. The stem is the part that I'm not going to use in general. You could throw the I Ching if you know how to do that with it. Uh, but this class, we won't cover that since I wouldn't know much about that. Um, so first, what I'm going to do is as plants age, often the older leaves are just brown and non-useful, non-aromatics, doesn't have the constituents. So you peel those off first. Next, what I'm going to do is take the leaves I want. Pretty much always a downward motion, by the way. It just works easier. All herbalists, I might have mentioned that these parts of their fingers are, alter, are uh, permanently frayed from, this, uh, from doing this motion, which is pulling down the leaves. So now this is what I'm going to use. I might sort out and take one or two bad leaves, but this is pretty good. And then I'm going to pop the top off for medicine. I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to take it, <laughs> make a face. And there it is right there. So, you know, these are pedicels and petioles, but they're fine. And so basically, I have some leaves and some flowers. And when I talk about the medicine, we can use it fresh or dried. Uh, both are very useful. And that's the beginning. Now, here's something that's important about yarrow that gets overlooked commonly. Yarrow is very commonly used, of course. By of course, meaning it's commonly used. Yarrow grows as a colonial or as a uh, colonizing plant. And what I mean by that is that yarrow grows underneath the soil in roots that go horizontal to the soil. So I'm going to have John put, show what I'm talking about here. So these are flowering stalks of yarrow. But right here and right here are probably the same plant. So basically here and here, and there's a stalk right here, for instance. You can see some leaves. Might be hard to see with getting, getting around all these other plants. Yarrow some, usually, often, not always, grows with other plants. And then this. The importance of that is that often people want yarrow and are looking only for the flowering tops. And they're missing because it might not be in flower. You can have hundreds and hundreds hundreds of leaves scattered around the ground uh, and none of them are in flower for that particular plant. But the leaves work fine. The flowers are useful, but the leaves work really well as well. So what I'm saying is when you're looking for yarrow, you can note the old stalks or just look on the ground because often you find it. And so you can use this and I hope that makes sense to people, but what I'm talking about here is don't get stuck only looking for the flowering stalks. The plant is often replete growing along the ground. As far as identifying it, you just have to learn botany or study with people that really know their plants. As you know, as you'll hear in these courses, I'm a botanist and I just, more than being a botanist, what I'm saying is like I love to look at plants and it's the only way to really validate many plants identity and so you're taking risks unless you really know what the plant is. So yarrow often has, it's funny I'm smelling this one, it has very little smell which is unusual, but the smell is characteristic but please learn what plants you're gathering so you don't pick endangered plants, so you don't use poisonous plants, etc. But in general when I'm gathering yarrow what I'll do is find the field 
um, that has a bunch of stocks. There's not too many around here. I wouldn't gather from here. And I'll just start gathering it just as I've talked about. As you just saw, when I cut this flower stalk, I'm actually not killing the plant. The plant is growing underneath the ground with leaves springing up all over the place. So I'm only taking a part of the plant. I mean, you just got to consider it. But it is a common plant. Uh, there's debate whether this one is native or not. But we all want some, I want some yarrow everywhere. So that's the beginning. So we have a little bit of wild crafting, a tiny bit of botany. Uh, there'll be photographs on the website, uh, on this video website, where I'll have some close-ups of these flowers. Uh, in small, if you, hopefully everybody's learning to carry their 10, excuse me, their 20 power magnifying lens so that you can get in there and you can see the oval ray flowers and the, um, the regular corollas with the yellow orange stamen coming up. What I'm saying is it's a lot of fun to look at plants up close. So now that I've talked about how to identify yarrow and some ways to gather it, I want to speak about how to make medicine preparations before we talk about uses. <clears throat> And so uh, the first thing to know is that yarrow is a very miscible plant. And what miscible means is that the constituents, the chemicals, the stuff in it that you want in your medicine uh, comes out of it pretty readily. So you can make yarrow tinctures and alcohol. You can make yarrow vinegars and vinegar. Yarrow will probably, I haven't tried this, but you can probably, yarrow would come out in vegetable glycerin. Yarrow comes out in oils. Uh, yarrow comes out in honeys. So if you want to use yarrow, one of the beauties of it is you can put it in a wide variety of fluids. The technical word for those fluids is called menstruum. So a way to, if you want to sound all smarty pants, which I often do, you can say that yarrow is miscible in a wide variety of menstrua. Menstrua is just many menstruums instead of menstruums. And so you can, I'll say it again. You can make honeys, vinegars, oils, tinctures, and of course, I didn't say it, but teas. It's in water. So there's a lot of ways of getting it into people, which may be important because it doesn't taste very good. Uh, it's a pretty bitter plant. It's not the most bitter plant, but the bitter scale doesn't, is very individual. Like some people can drink hops, others can't. Some mugwort, others motherwort. Yarrow fits into the pretty darn bitters category. So if you're going to be using it internally, it's a, it's a consideration. All right. So this, there's a lot of uses for yarrow. And in this class, uh, the focus is on first aid. So yarrow does two things particularly well first aid wise. The first is it's just a very good antiseptic. So for me, an antiseptic means covers a wide variety of organisms that might grow on our skin, but most likely bacteria. Uh, viruses, not so much. I'll be internal. I'll talk about that in a bit. And I'm not really sure so much if it does anything to fungi, quite honestly. So my focus really here is bacterial infections of the skin to start with, which are really common. So uh, staph infections are a common skin infection, the most common skin infection. Uh, it's a place to try it. Uh, there's a whole other part of this, if you look for it, about staph infections, and it's not simple. The loss of staph is not simple, but yarrow is one option. But the place where I see yarrow shine is in animal bites. Most of the animal bites that I work with are dog bites, dogs biting people. I have occasionally worked with human bites, people biting people, which is also problematic. But without getting into a long spiel about it, uh, bites are always problematic. Well, even smaller animals, reptiles and such. And the reason for it is that most animals, by animals I mean animals, all of them, mammals and reptiles and other things, insects, they can have bacteria on their gums. And so when they bite, those bacteria can take hold. But also just putting holes in your body allows other bacteria to enter since the skin is a primary defense. So I mostly work with dog bites, secondarily human bites, and occasionally cat bites. What I want to do though is focus and put this in the example of a dog bite, which I see the most of. So 
what happens when dogs bite is the way that their teeth are set up, they put holes in you, but they also just break up and tear a lot of skin. Dogs have all kinds of stuff in their gums, you know, besides the fact that they eat weird foods, meaning stuff that's left on the ground. And so when they bite, uh, the tissue is torn up in a way and it doesn't heal fast. And so inflammation might happen in a minute. And then also though, just infection is very common after dog bites. So in this, for instance, using Yarrow, uh, you're working someplace in a first aid station. Somebody comes in and says that they got bit by a dog. Uh, this one, I'm not going to get into this, but I just want to make sure that when that happens, the first thing you're going to ask is, are other people safe, right? Because it's a mad dog biting a lot of people. You have to get somebody in that situation. Uh, the second thing is, does the dog have shots for rabies? So you, it's best if you can find uh, the person who cares for that dog. So there's a whole other bunch of stuff with animal bites. I just want to say, though, for me as a first aid worker, it's important for community safety. It could be somebody petting a dog and getting bit, or it could be a dog that's just rampaging, and that's important to know. As soon as somebody says they got bit by a dog and it's penetrated the skin, and it's, you know, it's not just a, it's any kind of bite that's gone deeper into the epidermal layer, they got bit and they have a cut, I'm going to immediately suggest medicine and we're going to just treat right away. Preventative care for bites is important. You don't know if the medicines you work help because the person won't get an infection, but we'll get into when it's active. But I'm saying again, somebody gets bit by a dog or a cat or a ferret or a weasel, a muskrat, whatever they got bit by, uh, you're going to prepare the, uh, the preparation I'm about to get into. So what you're going to do is gather a bunch of yarrow if you don't have it already. I've, I like the tea better than the tincture. So get a bunch of yarrow. You can put the stalks in the tea or not, but usually I'm just going to peel the leaves and the flowers. When I talked about the stalks, I said that they're not that medicinal, but they're also not anti-medicinal. So if you're going to make a quick preparation, you could just also just cut a whole bunch of stalks if you have them handy. And I'm usually when I'm doing first aid out in a wilderness situation or just like a not in a kitchen, it's just going to kind of be quick and dirty. Usually I'm just going to get some pot. I usually have one of the stoves that fit on top of these propane. I just happen to have this from somebody. Uh, it's a good prop though. Then I have the little stove tops that fit in. They're just really handy because also you can travel and you, know, you can mail the top because you can't mail, you can't uh, put these on airline luggage. So, so I have a top that just screws into these. Um, and then I just have a pot that I put on there. And then I just start cutting up or just putting up, peeling and putting the yarrow and just basically get the water really hot, get the yarrow in there. After the water starts to boil, turn it off. If I have any kind of lid, an old uh, plastic plate that won't melt or a metal top, I'll put that on. And the reason I'm putting that on is the aromatics of yarrow. It's a smelly plant generally. Those aromatics are part of the medicinal uh, preparation. So if you can cover it and let it sit for a few minutes as it cools, some of those aromatics will stay in the water rather than getting evaporated into the air. So, uh, and then the person's going to soak that part. The most common place by far for dog bites is the hands because people are petting dogs or breaking up dog fights. So hands, maybe wrists. That's easy because it's easy to have them soak it in a like a two and a half gallon uh, container with just hot yarrow tea and then enough water to get their hands in it. Keep the preparation hot. Not, you don't want to boil the person's hand because actually excess heat, if it burns them, everything gets worse because if you burn it, you change the way the immune system is functioning locally because now the immune system has to go throughout the whole burn. All right, so you basically get some kind of plastic bin or whatever you have, some kind of pot. You're going to put in hot water uh, and yarrow, unless you've cooked the yarrow in the water, and then enough water to cover it so when they put their hands in there, just test the water, have them put their hand in, and as soon as it's acceptably not burning, have them stick their hands in and keep it in. You want that heat because it opens the cells up and allows the yarrow in a little bit better, or any medicine for that matter. And then you just sit there and soak it. So that's it. So I made it sound very complex as normal. But basically, you're going to take yarrow, you're going to make a strong yarrow tea, and you're going to have the person 
soak their hands, their feet. Um, not too long ago, I met somebody, uh, the dog jumped on them and bit them right there. And so what we did is we took the yarrow, made a strong tea, and just took a cloth and made a compress and held a compress up against them and just kept heating up the compress and holding it. So you can definitely do that as well. But soaking it is, if you have the option, is nice. It's just easy. The person can relax. You know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff with animal bites. I would almost always give a bunch of echinacea <clears throat> uh, to stimulate their immunity. Uh, I find echinacea a great innate immune stimulant, which is what you want generally in a dog bite. And so there's other things. The other thing about dog bites is that the person's often in a high-strung mode because they just got bit by another mammal and they're upset and so often working from there too. Now back again to Yarrow. Um, another place that I like to use Yarrow is any kind of uh, respiratory virus. So it could be a cold or a flu, not for allergies. So when somebody you're working someplace and people are drippy and snotty. Um, you have to figure, is it dust? Is it allergies? Is it something else? But if you think it's a respiratory virus, along with other herbs, like Oregon grape root, or golden seal, or OSHA, or its cousin Boneset, or uh, some, of those, some of those other plants, I often add yarrow. The reason I add yarrow in those situations is that yarrow is anti-infective, and I think that it might help, if you keep taking it through the course of the virus, prevent secondary bacterial infections. And personally, I feel like, even though I'm using it in these other situations as primarily an innate immune stimulant, I feel like it also might stimulate adaptive immunity to help kill the virus. So I don't know any science on it, but I don't really need it. So when you're making cold and flu formulas, teas or tinctures, I often add yarrow. The one more part about yarrow that fits into both these things, this cold and flu segment and the dog bite segment, um, is that it's mildly anti-inflammatory. It's related to chamomile. Uh, it's related to chamomile in the same family, the Asteraceae, but they both contain similar essential oil. The bigger name is azulene. And so I don't, can't speak much of the specific chemical, except both of that, those plants have this constituent, and they have anti-inflammatory action. And so with dog bites, you get bad inflammation, and with viruses, you often get inflammation, which bring on all those symptoms. So I really like to use yarrow in colds and flus, both as a, an immune stimulant, as something um, that might help kill bacteria for a secondary bacterial growth, and also to reduce some of the inflammation associated uh, with colds and flus. So other ways you can use yarrow, so if you don't want to make tinctures from it, and somebody has difficulty with alcohol, uh, you can also just make tea with it and drink the tea. Uh, if you wanted to make it and you're working with picky uh, folks, which I mean picky, it's not really that picky not to like these things, but you can put it in honey, realizing the sugar will have its own effect, sometimes negative, sometimes just helps the person get it down. When you make it with sugar, though, add a lot of yarrow. When you, excuse me, when you're making a honey, so sugar, you can use sugar, but I'm really talking about honeys. The one trick with honey is if you're adding fresh plants to a honey, if there's too much water in the fresh plant, the honey will ferment and go bad. So it's the, but yarrow is, doesn't have a lot of water to it. So you can add a plenty, you want a lot of yarrow in your honey, it'll be sweet and still bitter uh, to use as a cold and flu uh, syrup. The one more place to use yarrow, once again, there's lots of uses, but we'll start winding up with this, is that uh, you can definitely, you can make an oil from yarrow. So to make the oil, you want to make sure it doesn't have too much moisture, uh, but usually yarrow is kind of born dry. So same thing, cut, take the stem, take the leaves, take the flower tops, um, and just uh, put them in a jar a clean jar. It's clean and dry is important with oils. And then just cover it and this much yarrow and uh, leaves and flowers and maybe this much oil on top of it. Uh, when you're making oils, don't put a lid on them. Just put a cloth. Let, them, let the oils breathe. Put a cloth on it. I often use mason jars and so I could just put the band, the thing that goes around, not the liddy thing, but the band thing, or put a rubber band around the cloth just so dirt doesn't get in there and let it sit for at least two weeks. Uh, if you stir it and just make sure everything gets underneath, it's useful. It 
it could go bad, but my yarrow oils tend to not grow molds on them for whatever reason. And that oil could be put on directly onto wounds that might get infected or into salves. So it's just really nice if somebody has chronic infections and want to put gentle instead of liniments, which are an isopropyl alcohol. So just to sneak that back in, yarrow can go into isopropyl alcohol. And that's called a liniment for topical use, rubbing alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol is rubbing alcohol. Um, and tinctures, but also if you want, if the person has a braided skin and they want something gentle and you're not worried about things growing underneath the oil, uh, then you could just put yarrow in an oil base. You can make that into a salve or you can just use that directly onto things that you're worried about getting infected or a little infected. So yarrow uh, covers the space as an antiseptic, covers the space as a, uh, as a minor, I guess, or not very strong, but diligent anti-inflammatory, uh, specifically for me, because I've had the best results for dog bites. Um, but let me give one uh, story that, that I often tell, uh, because I, I watched it. So this story has a couple of parts to it, so try to follow through in here. And I was working with this man many years ago, and he was working with some kind of uh, electrical powered saw, and basically part, mostly cut off the tip of one of his fingers. Uh, he went and had the finger re-sewn back on, and I don't know who did it, but it was a terrible job. The sewing was, it was still falling off, and uh, when I saw it, so this, again, two-part story, when I saw it, it looked terrible. It was blackening up, meaning not getting oxygenation, meaning not good blood flow into there. Pretty scary looking, you know, deciding if I was capable of working with it. But what I found out, is that the day before he had seen somebody else and they put, they wrapped his finger in comfrey. And the reason for that is they were trying to kind of glue the finger. It's not a reason, comfrey sometimes helps uh, skin tissue regrow. But the problem is he used comfrey and what was happening is he might have been getting some tissue growth on the tip of his finger, but it was cutting off oxygen getting in. And so basically the blackening was having some superficial tissue growth, but nothing killing infection inside. In other words, we had to really do something because uh, basically starting to get septic, starting to get blood poisoning inside of his finger. So the first rule there is that don't use comfrey to seal a wound until you know for sure that uh, that there's no more infection inside. You don't want to make a superficial epithelial skin growth on the outside if there's any chance for infection inside. So then what I did is we just made some really strong yarrow tea and uh, we started soaking his finger in as hot as he can. Fingers can get usually hotter because a lot of people are used to picking up hot things with the finger as opposed to palms or wrists. And so I started doing it and within a day and a half, something like that, the finger just started pinking up, meaning positive blood flow and on the healing uh, on the healing it was getting it was starting to heal up um, and within a couple of days it looked great I don't sew yet hopefully someday so we still had to get somebody to work it and get it in place uh, but the yarrow is the first time so this is one of those stories that you say because you used it once it was amazing it was amazing since then I've used it many times uh, for just that situation An infection that's gone bad all right so another story keeping moving along. Uh, somebody got bit by a dog. I told them to do something. They didn't. They came back two days later. They got bit here. Hand amazingly swollen. Very infected. Um, stuck in a yarrow. Once again, about a day later. So, you know, there's always the question of would it have gotten better? But I could say in both those instances, probably not. And so yarrow just has the ability to kill whatever bacteria are involved in these situations. Um, and so I just use it a lot. I use the tincture internally, as I said, or teas for colds and flus, and I just love it as a compress and soak. So learn to recognize yarrow, both in its flowering stage, um, and also just as a leaf on the ground, it can be one of the last plants to flower. Another thing to realize is that uh, yarrow, even after it's finished flowering, the infructescence, this is an inflorescence, the flowers, infructescence, the fruits or the seeds, are still recognizable. So you can find it even next year before it flowers by looking for last year's flowering stalks. So I hope this gives people uh, an excellent overview of using yarrow, getting to know yarrow, 
uh, embracing yarrow, uh, meaning bringing it into your practice, primarily for me, first aid, but sometimes, you know, in chronic health care, I'm looking at warding off infections or helping to kill stuff in people's bodies. Uh, it is called, so one more thing, I, I think I classically say one more thing for about 30 minutes after everything. Uh, it's called sneeze weeds, and I, I, I'm going to give another story. So this will be no more than two hours. John said it's 10 minutes, by the way, uh, a while ago. So I had a friend that used to come over to my house, and every time she came to visit, she just started sneezing like mad. And Yarrow ha definitely has the name sneezeweed as well. And she also had allergies, and I never thought about it, but hanging up, uh, along, I, I sometimes hang her up, not to dry them. It's, it's, to me, it's not one of the better ways of drying a lot of work. And so every time she opened the door, basically, the yarrow, because I had it up in flower, released pollen. And this is what I think happened, is you just get really bad allergies. So one day I thought about it, I just took down all the yarrow, and then it just never came back. So I guess probably the, for some people, uh, it's just one anecdotal story, the, the pollen, uh, my, my cause it. So if you're gathering it and you're allergic, maybe wearing a bandana. So, all right. So for those of you who are viewing this and are thinking about doing the class, I want to say this is the level of detail that I often get into. In this program, we talk a lot about the physiology, uh, the specific ways of using the plants. So I just, for those who are interested in this kind of class, I want to say that that's consistent with my approach to herbal medicine, putting in a lot of the inputs. Uh, so I think that you'll enjoy the level of detail and it'll, it'll help bolster our, our understanding of why we use specific herbal medicines.